please welcome Race Point Global's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Larry Weber, and the Executive Director at the Institute for the Future, Marina Gorbis. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I have the pleasure of uh, having a discussion today with Marina Gorbis, who's the Executive Director of the Institute of the Future. Everybody's trying to predict the future. That hasn't changed. Uh, she's, us. <laughs> except you. <laughs> Uh, she's the author of The Nature of the Future, which I quickly read the last two days on planes, and I recommend it highly. Uh, Dispatches from the Social Structured World. So my first question is a broad question for you, Marina, and that is, tell us a little bit about the nature of the future and how the Institute approaches, you know, understanding what's going to happen, and then maybe we can get more specific into some of the areas that uh, are, are important to us all in this room today. So. Sure, um, well, first of all, we don't try to predict the future, and we don't think that anybody can predict the future, and if somebody tells you they can predict the future, just don't believe them, especially if they're from California. So we don't try to predict the future. Um, we, what we do, a lot of our work is we actually look at signals. So, you know, the famous uh, William Gibson phrase, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So there are signs of the future. There are people and things that are from the future who are basically around us. And we look at those signals and try to understand, is this noise, is this something new? A lot of times these things look weird and different and strange, but we like to look at them and say, what is the larger story that these signals are telling us? And if you bring all these signals together, what is the pattern, larger pattern that's unfolding? So a lot of our work is understanding these patterns of we're moving from this kind of world into this kind of world. So that's a lot of our work. And ultimately, what we try to do, and we're looking a lot at technologies, but technologies is just one of the areas that is changing. You know, we look at demographics, we look at usage patterns, we look at people's behaviors, we do a lot of ethnographic work to really understand how are people using, how are they interacting with these technologies, what does it mean to them, what's their meaning, larger context. And ultimately, we try to use that foresight uh, to ask ourselves questions and organizations that we work with, what does it mean for them? What's important? What's the insight here? Because every good strategy is based on a good insight about the future. So that's really what we're about. So tell me a, a little broader question since we're sitting here in what some people would call, at least in, in our time period, the most innovative place on earth and that has to be impacting the future. What's the Institute's view of Silicon Valley <laughs> and, and its place in sort of man's history of innovation, man and women's history of innovation? And I would say definitely I think of Silicon Valley and there is a reason why the Institute has been here for almost 50 years. It, this is a great place, a lot of innovation is taking place here. We're surrounded by signals. Most of them are technology signals, right? So companies, R&D labs, people doing interesting things. So that's one side of it. There are also some very interesting social patterns. People, you know, the whole sharing economy really started here in Silicon Valley. So a lot of kind of interaction of technology and social innovation that is happening here. On the other hand, there are a lot of interesting innovations that are happening all around the world. If you look at mobile payments and use of mobile technologies for trade and all of these other areas, it's really happening more in other places around the world. It's happening in Africa. Um, it's happening, if you look at early cell phone usage, we're actually looking at Japan. Remember iMode, which was yeah, the phone? And all the teenagers were in constantly connected with each other. So we were doing ethnographic work in Japan because a lot of innovation and usage was coming from there. So some of it is here, but some of it is also, you have to look globally today. Well, speaking of globally, do you ever look at the Institute? Um, you know, I, I'm old enough to ask this gang, uh, and I also represented some of these companies, but you would see on the cover of magazines and for periods of time, digital equipment's gonna take over the computing world, or Wang Laboratories is gonna take it over, or Tandy <laughs> is gonna take it over. Do you think we're also, that's a pattern that maybe a Facebook will die, or that maybe a LinkedIn will die, or that even an Apple will die? 
It's all possible. Nobody can predict that. <laughs> I'm not going to predict the demise I'm sorry, of Facebook. I'm sorry. I'm not asking. Not asking you to predict. <laughs> but it's but... it's possible. Um, you know, if you look at the overall data of what's been happening on longevity of corporations, it's been decreasing. So the whole lifespan of organization has been decreasing. The turnover is higher. Um, the tenure of executives is much lower. So it's possible that. You know, every company here has to be on its toes constantly because I think the nature of the future is that you never know who is working out of their garage and producing a piece of software that maybe will totally displace what you're doing. And the fact is that today it is possible for one or two people or a small group of people to create something that may well displace your company. Um, and that's the nature of the future, really. Let's look at some categories, the nature of the future of work. How are we really going to be, again, not predictive, but from your patterns and your view? I mean, right in close to this town, we had someone, uh, her name begins with M, I won't mention it, at mm -hmm. Yahoo, who said you can't work from home anymore, you mm -hmm. know? So what is the nature of work, or the nature of the future of work, from your guys' opinions? So, one of the things we do, when you think about the future, a lot of times we're kind of limited in our imagination for the last about 100 years. We think that the way things, the last 100 years, and what we have and what we, how we live has been kind of preordained. That's the only way to do things. So actually, as futurists, we look in the past a lot. We're all also historians. And the interesting thing is that we didn't always work and produce everything through large formal organizations. If you look at the whole history of humanity, it's only in the last 300 years, this whole notion of wage labor, the notion that you can sell your time and your effort as a commodity to somebody else. So in totality of human experience with 50, 60,000 years, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. So I think that in work, we're seeing new patterns of work. So uh, we actually doing um, a lot of research, ethnographic research on what we call extreme workers. So look at people who are what's called micro workers. These people may be signed on on five, four different platforms, Uber, Lyft, you know, Postmates, TaskRabbit, and other kinds of things. And they sort of weave these tasks together to sustain their livelihoods. I'm not going to make judgment about whether it's good or bad, but it's basically why is that an interesting signal to us and what are they signaling? They're, one of the signals is that it's possible, first of all, nobody's telling them you have to come to work nine to five or eight to six or whatever. It, they make themselves available at certain times for certain kind of tasks. So, Especially like Uber. Like Uber. Yeah. And yeah. you may decide that you want to drive four to six in the morning because you can make more money that way. So it's, it's really kind of reversing the whole equation, saying instead of you, employer, telling me what to do and when to do it, I'm going to make myself available and choose what I'm going to be doing. Um, so that's an interesting type of work. Uh, I think the other sort of interesting archetype are people who are what we call amplified entrepreneurs. So it's people who are maybe one person, two people, and they use all of these platforms and apps, like Odesk and others, to outsource every function that you would have in an organization. And these one or two people are basically able to have this kind of scale a lot of times that previously you needed a whole organization to do or no organization to do. And sometimes they probably sit in their pajamas at home and they're commanding an army of people who are doing various things, accounting, travel, you know, all the different things that you can do. Do you have a side thought as long as we're looking at work, you know, because I just was in Washington and, and there was a committee trying to figure out how can we be more competitive and how do we create more jobs? And then somebody had mentioned, well, Facebook, you know, paid recently $19 billion for a company of 55 people. That's not a lot of jobs. Have yeah. you looked at that at the Institute? Absolutely. Um, you know, between automation and all these connective platforms that we have where you can reach a lot of people and create things without actually 
creating a company, um, that is having huge impacts. And yes, you can have 55 people creating a lot of value. You know, you can argue whether that particular price was right. overpriced right. or not. That's a whole different story. But it is possible. Uh, I mean, look at Wikipedia. Um, you don't need to go to a commercial company. Basically, what, fewer than 200 people work actually employees at Wikipedia, and basically they displaced Encyclopedia Britannica in a fairly short period of time. Now you're looking at, instead of thousands of people, thousands of employees, uh, millions of dollars, you have this platform, really, that it was fewer than 200 people is creating a tremendous knowledge resource, and that's possible. So, yeah, I think we've all seen the data that productivity has been going up, and it's been going up quite a lot. It doesn't translate into more jobs, and it doesn't translate necessarily into higher incomes for people. Speaking of, you're going down a disruption path here a little bit around the nature of the future. How about education? Uh, looks like it's ready for big disruption. Yes, education, <laughs> one of my favorite subjects. Um, I think what's happening in education is very interesting. Um, I think that at least in this country we've been, and in this area, region, we've been so fixating on these MOOCs, massively open online courses, because now you can get all of your education online, and all you have to do is watch these video lectures and do all these other things. And I think it's sort of missing the point that it's almost like reminds me when we introduce new technology, we sort of want to use it in old ways, right? So when people of early TV announced, I mean, yeah, the early TV announcers, they sounded like they were on the radio, and they stood like they were on the radio. Right, I right. think it's the same story with MOOCs. It's not just about MOOCs. It's a fa fact is that we have what were the resources that were textbooks, classrooms, all of that is now open. So anything you want to learn is potentially out there. So we talk about education moving from educational institutions into learning flows. So imagine in this flow, it's like a river or an ocean, you have everything that's possible that's available for you to learn, right? So the question becomes, what, is, what motivates you to tap into that flow? What motivates you to actually learn? And it turns out that a lot of that is social motivation. It's what your community, what are people in your network what do they care about? What's the conversations about? And that's why you're seeing actually the whole resurgence of very physically based spaces. Like, you know, you have sort of all these meetups happening all the time. There's probably more gatherings happening in Silicon Valley around issues. On every issue, there are people coming together in meetups and hackathons and learning sessions and co-writing sessions, all of that. And those are all learning spaces. All of these new spaces are learning spaces. And these spaces are beginning to compete with sort of traditional educational spaces that are not structured for that. I love this, there's one, um, there's a, a new university that was started in Paris and it's completely, it has no teachers. It's completely free, it has no teachers. It's completely peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning, people learning from each other. Um, they grant degrees, and apparently um, to get in is harder to get than to get into Harvard. <laughs> Only one out of uh, some incredible amount. So it sort of stands up the whole idea of how do people learn? What, what motivates them to learn on its head? So I think that we're, the good thing about it is that we've never kind of rethought basic pedagogy. We, you know, we've been doing it for a long time, for the last hundred years in this way, in classrooms. And so I think what these technologies are calling on us to do is to really rethink basic pedagogy and what makes it, what drives people to learn, and how do you create spaces and environments and social settings, absolutely social settings for learning. I mean, we could talk all afternoon about education and that. Yes. But uh, let's go to one of my favorite topics, which is the future of governance and the patterns you might be seeing. My 24-year-old daughter uh, texted me, the world's falling apart, Dad. <laughs> you know, where's, where's the governance here? And, you know, everything from what's going on in the world, but also what happens when we can all vote from our smartphone? 
or our smart device because they're cheap enough that everyone has one. You and, know. and why aren't we doing that why today? Why aren't we doing that today? And right. does that change governance and democracy because somebody with 11% of the vote can become president? Yeah. You know. Exactly. And I don't know, I guess Gavin Newsom was here before, so he probably had a lot to say, say about, about that, that yeah. with Citizenville and others. There are a lot of interesting things that are happening in governance. A lot of them are happening at sort of city or local levels, because in some ways it's more manageable and it's possible to experiment a lot more. Um, there are several interesting things. And one of the, I think, sort of disruptive drivers of that is that Today, people are able to collect their own data, whether it's you know quantified self, people collecting their health data, or it's data on the environment environment in their region, the state of the creek, and all of that. You know, we're just loaded with the devices with various kinds of sensors, and we can put them everywhere. And you can put it in your backyard, you can put it in your neighbors, and when you aggregate that data. Basically, people are seeing the world through new eyes. You can create your own maps of the world. So that's a huge empowering piece of this right there, that people are able to collect the kind of data that previously maybe only government institutions or nobody get the view of what's needed. I love this little project in um, San Francisco where uh, they outfitted Tenderloin with noise sensors and create a, a map of noise levels in the tenderloin. Well, noise is associated with all kinds of learning issues and all kinds of other stress issues and other. So these basically citizens created their own map of their neighborhood and that will activate them to basically request new things from the government and to organize around those things. So the data itself moving from institutions to individuals and individuals being able to do stuff and do analytics with that is, is really important. I think the other piece of the equation is that we have all kinds of platforms and spaces where people can voice their opinions and we're getting better at them. Some of them, you know, it's sometimes it's a free for all, but that's yeah. part of a, a democracy. But sometimes they're very sophisticated, you know, of all places, the Pirate Party in Germany is using this uh, platform called Liquid Software, where you can basically, what you do is you, on any issue, you can delegate your vote to somebody who's an expert in that particular area. So the most- Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. so the most um, valued, uh, the person with the greatest reputation there on some issues is this professor at some university in Germany. So you can use these various software tools to engage in conversations, but also if we build them smartly, design, that's why design is so important in all these platforms, um, you can actually really change the nature of the conversation. And so those are kind of things where people are beginning to implement them at the local level, at the level of cities. You know, Code for America is doing a lot of interesting things. San Francisco and New York are probably central hot spots for these innovations, but bringing together this sort of democratized data, all kinds of opinion and participation platforms. The other thing that we have in governance is, you know, you can create pretty sophisticated simulations these days where you can run increasingly Absolutely. policy yeah. decisions and choices that probably would create better outcomes than what we have right now. Well, I don't know how many people here would give their vote on climate change to Al Gore, but you know we we could do, I don't a, know. <laughs> we could do a poll later. Uh, you know, because we're at Techmanity at the, the the first year of it, I I thought I'd ask this question um, as we wind down, and that is when I started in business, we were always told go make your money, and then might, maybe you'll have time for philanthropy or doing good later. And what happens right now? I'm seeing a lot of millennials, especially, saying. Look, of course we know we have to make some money, but we also want to do good, and we want to embed solving some of the world's problems into the economic equation. Is this just their fantasy, or is this something the Institute is actually seeing data and patterns around? Maybe there has been a behavioral change in a generation that is saying, you know what, let's tr give this a shot of integrating moral purpose and economics. 
Yeah, I, clearly there is data that shows millennials are more interested in kind of larger meaning and being a part of something that's meaningful and greater than themselves. And I don't think it's kind of a passing fad. I, I think even more interesting, if you look at some of the data on and surveys on the post-millennial generation, which is kids who are born after 95 and after. What do they call those, by the way? Oh, many different Z generation. I don't know. Anybody knows what it is? Um, all kinds of... Uh, I, I'm, generation 95, we'll call Generation it. Oh, 95 okay, and okay, after. Yeah. But what's interesting about them and what's different about them is that they're actually not that interested in material things. And you can say, okay, it's a life stage, but they're not interesting in cars. Cars are not status symbols for them. They actually don't want to have cars. They Pain, it's a headache. It's yeah. a headache, right? Yeah. They're yeah. not interested in owning, owning cars. Homes, which is another sort another of another headache. Another <laughs> headache, right? So it's it's interesting. I think that that demographic change in sort of cultural attitudes. You know, this generation grew up in the recession and all these other things. But I think it will have a lasting impact, um, and they're going to be driving. And if you think about that, if basically we're this generation, 95 and after, is going to be consuming less the whole consumption-based model doesn't work particularly well. Yeah. So some last thoughts you have maybe on the Institute's work going into the future that you think are most salient to this audience that is trying to look at what I would call the integration of great innovation and the greatest innovations disappear and become part of the fabric of our lives. Some thoughts on that. I think that the largest, and it's scary and it's exciting at the same time, is that the kind of technologies we've been building for the last 40, 50 years, which is basically the internet and all these technologies of participation, as much as they're about technologies, they're really about changing our social and economic infrastructure. And the way they're changing that is basically mirroring the whole underpinning of the internet, which is distributed, resilient, emergent, all these other things. Not particularly, you can't plan as well. So what's happening is that it's possible now for individuals and groups to do the kinds of things that previously you needed a whole organization to do. Or uh, no organization could do. You look at all the citizen science things that are happening, and that, it doesn't mean all the organizations will go away. It's just that the kind of economic rationale is changing dramatically. And so what started happening in entertainment business, in publishing, where all of a sudden everybody can write and get audience and readers, you know, is happening in music today. People going outside of labels and people, musicians being able to create things. And it's happening in education. You know, if you're brave enough not to go to college, but you're passionate about learning, you can learn everything you need by using all these resources. Marina, Marina Gorbis, Executive Director of Institute for the Future, thank you for being here at uh, the inaugural Techmanity. Thanks for what you do Thanks. in not predicting things, thank but at you. least showing us the patterns to a better world. Um, that's terrific. And do pick up her book, The Nature of the Future Dispatches from the Social Structured World. It's actually very, very good. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you for having us. Thank you us, so everyone. much for having me.